That art thou. Or, you are the force. In studying the perennial philosophy of the Jedi, we can begin either at the bottom, with practice and morality, or at the top, with a consideration of metaphysical truths, or finally, in the middle, at the focal point where mind and matter, action and thought have their meeting place in human psychology. The lower gate is preferred by strictly practical teachers. People like Gotama Buddha have no use for speculation and whose primary concern is to put out in people's hearts the hideous fires of greed, resentment and infatuation. Through the upper gate go those whose vocation it is to think and speculate, the born philosophers and theologians. The middle gate gives entrance to the exponents of what has been called spiritual religion by the devout contemplatives of India, the Sufi Jedi of Islam, the Catholic mystic Jedi of the later Middle Ages, and in the Protestant Jedi tradition, such men as Denk and Frank and Castellio, as Everard and John Smith, the first Quaker Jedi, and William Law. It is through this central door, and just because it is central, that we shall make our entry into the subject matter of this book. The psychology of the perennial philosophy of the Jedi has its source in metaphysics, and issues logically in a characteristic way of life and system of ethics. Starting from this midpoint of the doctrine, it is easy for the mind to subsequently move in either direction. In the present chapter, we shall confine our attention to but a single feature of this traditional psychology. The most important, the most emphatically insisted upon by all exponents of the perennial philosophy of the Jedi, and, we may add, the least psychological. For the doctrine that is to be illustrated in this chapter belongs to the study of oneself rather than the psychology, to the science, not of the personal ego, but of that eternal self in the depth of particular individualised selves and identical with, or at least akin to, the Force. Based upon the direct experience of those who have fulfilled the necessary conditions of such knowledge, this teaching is expressed most succinctly in the Sanskrit formula Tat Dvam Asi That art thou You are the Force manifest or you, the immanent eternal identity, are one with the unmanifest force, the absolute principle of all existence. Indeed, the very last end of every human being is to discover that fact for themselves and to find out who they really are. Quote, the more the force is recognised in all things, the more it is recognised outside them, the more it is within, the more without. Eckhart. End quote. Only the transcendent, the completely other, can be imminent without being modified by the becoming of that in which it dwells. The perennial philosophy of the Jedi states that it is desirable and indeed necessary to know the unmanifest force. Not only within the psyche, but also outside, in the world, beyond world and mind, in its transcendent otherness, in liberation. Quote, Though the force is everywhere present, you can only find it in the deepest and most central part of your mind. The natural senses cannot possess the force or unite you to it. No, your inward faculties of understanding Will and memory can only reach after the force, but cannot be the place of its habitation in you. But there is a root or depth of you from where all these faculties come forth, as lines from a santa, or as branches from the body of a tree. This depth is called the santa, the fund, the bottom of the mind. This depth is the unity, the eternity, I had almost said the infinity of your mind, for it is so infinite that nothing can satisfy it or give it rest but the infinity of the Force. William Law End quote. 
This extract seems to contradict what was said above, but the contradiction is not a real one. The force within and the force without, these are two abstract notions which can be entertained by the intellect and expressed in words. But the facts to which these notions refer cannot be realised and experienced except in the deepest and most central part of the mind. And this is true no less of the force without than of the force within. But though these two abstract notions have to be realised, to use a spatial metaphor, in the same place, the intrinsic nature of the realisation of the force within is qualitatively different from that of the realisation of the force without. Each in turn is different from the realisation of the force as simultaneously within and without as the true identity of the perceiver and at the same time, in the words of the Bhagavad Gita, as that by which all the world is pervaded. Quote, when Svetiketu was 12 years old, he was sent to a teacher with whom he studied until he was 24 years old. After learning all the sacred manuscripts, he returned home full of conceit and condescension, in the belief that he was consummately well educated. His father said to him, Svetiketu, my child, you who are so full of learning and condescension, have you asked for that knowledge by which we hear the unhearable, by which we perceive that which cannot be perceived, and know what cannot be known? What is that knowledge, sir? asked Svetiketu. His father replied, In knowing one lump of clay, all that is made of clay is known, the difference being only in name. The secret is like clay. Once you know it, everything will be revealed. But surely these venerable teachers of mine are ignorant of this teaching, for if they possessed it, they would have imparted it to me. Will you, sir, therefore, give me that teaching? So be it, said the father, and he said, Bring me the fruit of the Nergoda tree. Here is one, sir. Break it. It is broken, sir. What do you see there? Some seeds, sir, exceedingly small. Break one of these. It is broken, sir. What do you see there? Nothing at all. The father said, My son, that subtle essence which you do not perceive, there in that very essence stands the being of the huge Nagoda tree. In that which is the subtle essence, all that exists has itself. That is the true, that is the self, and thou, Svetiketu, art that. Pray, sir, said the son, tell me more. Be it so, my child, the father replied, and he said, Place this salt in water, and come to me tomorrow morning. The son did as he was told. Next morning, the father said, Bring me the salt which you put in the water. The son looked for it, but could not find it for the salt, of course, had dissolved. The father said, Taste some of the water from the surface of the vessel. How is it? Salty. Taste some from the middle. How is it? Salty. Taste some from the bottom. How is it? Salty. The father said, Throw the water away, and then come back to me again. The son did so, but the salt was not lost for salt exists forever. Then the father said, Here likewise in this body of yours, my son, you do not perceive the force, but it is there. It is that which is the subtle essence. All that exists has itself. That is the force. That is the self. And thou, Svetiketu, art that. From the Chandogya Upanishad End quote. The person who wishes to know the that, which is thou, may set to work in any one of three ways. They may begin by looking inwards into their own particular thou, and by a process of dying to self, self in reasoning, self in willing, and self in feeling, come at last to a knowledge of the self, the abode of the force that is within. Or else, they may begin with the thous 
existing outside themselves and may try to realise their essential unity with the Force and with one another and with their own being. Or finally, and this is doubtless the best way, they may seek to approach the ultimate knowledge, the Force both from within and from without, so that they come to realise the Force experimentally as at once the principle of their own thou and of all other thous, animate and inanimate. The completely illuminated human being knows, with William Law, that the force is present in the deepest and most central part of their own mind. But they are also, at the same time, one who, in the words of Plotinus, quote, See all things, not in process of becoming, but in being and see themselves in the other. Each being contains in itself the whole intelligible world. Therefore, all is everywhere. Each is their all, and all is each. Individual humans, as they now live, have ceased to be in the all, but when they cease to only be individuals, they raise themselves again and penetrate the whole world. Plotinus. End quote. It is from the more or less obscure intuition of the oneness that is the ground and principle of all multiplicity that philosophy takes its source, and not philosophy alone, but natural science as well. All science, in Emile Meyerson's phrase, is the reduction of multiplicities to identities. Divining the force within and beyond the many we may find an intrinsic plausibility in any explanation of diversity in terms of a single principle. The philosophy of the Upanishads reappears, developed and enriched in the Bhagavad Gita and was finally systemized in the ninth century of our era by Shankara. Shankara's teaching, simultaneously theoretical and practical, as is that of all true exponents of the perennial philosophy of the Jedi, is summarised in his versified treatise, the Viveka Chudamani, the crest jewel of wisdom. All the following passages are taken from this conveniently brief and untechnical work. Quote, the force is that by which the universe is pervaded and which pervades, which causes all things to shine, and which nothing can cause to shine. The nature of the one reality must be known by one's own clear spiritual perception. It cannot be known through a learned scholar. Similarly, the form of the moon can only be known through one's own eyes. How can you know it through the eyes of others? What but the force is capable of removing the bonds of ignorance, passion, and self-interested action? Liberation cannot be achieved except by the perception of the identity of the individual spirit as commensurate with the universal spirit. It can be achieved neither by physical training, nor speculative philosophy, nor by the practice of religious ceremonies, nor by mere learning. Disease is not cured by pronouncing the name of the medicine, but by taking the medicine. Deliverance is not achieved by repeating the name, the force, but by directly experiencing the force. The force is the witness of the individual mind and its operations. It is absolute knowledge. The wise person is one who understands that the essence of the force is pure consciousness and who realizes this absolute identity. The identity of the force is affirmed in hundreds of sacred texts. Caste, creed, family, and lineage do not exist in the Force. The Force has neither name nor form. It transcends merit and demerit, is beyond time, space, and the objects of sense experience. Such is the Force, and thou art that. Meditate upon this truth within your consciousness. Supreme, beyond the power of speech to express, the force may be apprehended by the eye of pure illumination. Pure, absolute, and eternal reality. Such is the force, and thou art that. Meditate upon this truth within your consciousness. Though one, the force is the cause of the many. 
There is no other cause, and yet the force is independent of causation. Such is the force, and thou art that. Meditate upon this truth within your consciousness. The truth of the force may be understood intellectually, but, even in those who so understand, the desire for personal separateness is deep-rooted and powerful, for it exists from beginningless time. It creates the thought, I am the actor, I am that which experiences. This thought is the cause of bondage to conditional existence, birth and death, it can be removed only by earnest effort to live consistently in union with the force. By the sages, the eradication of this thought and the craving for personal separateness is called liberation. It is ignorance that causes us to identify ourselves with the body, the ego, the senses, or anything that is not the force. They are wise who overcome this ignorance through devotion to the force. When a person follows the way of the world, or the way of the flesh, or the way of tradition, i.e. when they believe in religious rites and the letter of the scriptures as though they were intrinsically sacred, true knowledge of reality cannot arise in them. The wise say that this threefold way is like an iron chain, binding the feet of those who aspire to escape from the prison of this world. The person who frees themselves from these chains achieves deliverance. End quote. In the Taoist formulations of the perennial philosophy of the Jedi, there is an insistence no less forcible than in the Upanishads, the Gita, and the writings of Shankara upon the universal immanence of the transcendent and manifest force. What follows is an extract from one of the great classics of Taoist literature, the Book of Chuang Tzu most of which seems to have been written around the turn of the 4th and 3rd centuries BCE. Quote, Do not ask whether the force is in this or that. It is in all beings. It is on this account that we apply to it the epithets of supreme, universal, and total. It has ordained that all things should be limited apart from itself, which is unlimited and infinite. As for manifestation, the force causes the succession of its phases, but it is not this succession. It is the author of cause and effect, but it is not the cause and effect. It is the author of condensations and dissipations, birth and death, changes of state, but is not itself condensations and dissipations. All proceeds from it and is under its influence. It is in all things, but is not identical with beings for it is neither differentiated nor limited. Chuang Tzu End quote. From Taoism, we pass to Mahayana Buddhism, which in the Far East came to be so closely associated with Taoism, borrowing and bestowing, until the two came at last to be fused in what is now known as Zen. The Lankavatara Sutra, from which the following extract is taken, was the scripture which the founder of Zen Buddhism expressly recommended to his first disciples. Quote, One nature, perfect and pervading, circulates in all beings. One reality, all comprehensive, contains within itself all perceived realities. The one moon reflects itself wherever there is a sheet of water and all reflections of the moon are embraced within the one moon. The force of all Jedi enter into my own being, and my own being is found in union with theirs. The inner light of the force is beyond praise and blame. Like space, it knows no boundaries. Yet it is here, within us, ever retaining its serenity and fullness. It is only when you hunt for it that you lose it. You cannot take hold of it, but equally you cannot get rid of it. And while you can do neither, it goes on its own way. You remain silent and it speaks. You speak and it is dumb. The great gate of charity is wide open, with no obstacles between you and it. Yung Chia Tashi End quote. I am not competent 
nor is this the place, to discuss the doctrinal differences between Buddhism and Hinduism. Let it suffice to point out that when he insisted that human beings are by nature not the force, the Buddha was evidently speaking about the personal self and not the universal self. The force controversialists, who appear in certain of the Pali scriptures, never so much as mention the Vedanta doctrine of the identity of the manifest force with the unmanifest force, or the non-identity of ego with the manifest force. What they maintain, and Gautama denies, is the substantial nature and eternal persistence of the individual mind, as an unintelligent person seeks for the source of music in the body of the lute, so do they look for a mind within the ego. About the existence of the force, as about most other metaphysical matters, the Buddha declines to speak, on the ground that such discussions do not tend to edification or spiritual progress among the members of a monastic order such as he had founded. But though it has its dangers, though it may become the most absorbing, because it is the most sincere and noblest of distractions, metaphysical thinking is unavoidable and finally necessary. Even the Hinyanist Jedi found this, and the latter Mahayanist Jedi were to develop in connection with the practice of their religion a splendid and imposing system of cosmological, ethical and psychological thought. This system was based upon the postulates of a strict idealism and professed to dispense with the idea of the force at all. But moral and spiritual experience was too strong for philosophical theory, and under the inspiration of direct experience, the writers of the Mahayana Sutras found themselves using all their ingenuity to explain why the Tathagata and the Bodhisattvas display an infinite charity towards beings that do not independently exist. At the same time, they stretched the framework of subjective idealism so as to make room for universal mind, qualified the idea of soullessness with the doctrine that if purified, the individual mind can identify itself with the universal mind, and while maintaining godlessness, asserted that this realisable Jedi mind is the inner consciousness of the eternal force, and that the Jedi mind is associated with a great compassionate heart, which desires the liberation of every sentient being and bestows divine grace on all who make a serious effort to achieve humanity's final end. In a word, despite their inauspicious vocabulary, the best of the Mahayana Sutras contain an authentic formulation of the perennial philosophy of the Jedi, a formulation which in some respects is more complete than any other. In India, as in Persia, Islamic thought came to be enriched by the doctrine that the force is imminent as well as transcendent, while to Islamic practice were added the moral disciplines and spiritual exercises by which the psyche is prepared for contemplation of unity with the force. It is a significant historical fact that the poet Jedi, Kabir, is claimed as a co-religionist, both by Muslims and Hindus. The politics of those whose goal is beyond time are always pacific. It is the idolaters of past and future, of reactionary memory and utopian dreams who do the persecuting and make the wars. Quote, Behold nothing but the one in all things, which is the second that leads you astray. Kabir. End quote. That this insight is not confined exclusively to the Jedi, but recognised obscurely by every human being, is proved by the very structure of our language. For language, as Richard Trench pointed out long ago, is often wiser not merely than the vulgar, but even than the wisest of those who speak it. Sometimes language locks up truths which were once well known, but have now been forgotten. In other cases, it holds the germs of truth, which though they were never clearly discerned, the genius of its framers caught glimpse of in a happy moment of divination. For example, how significant is it 
that in the Indo-European languages, the root meaning to should connote badness. The Greek prefix dis, as in dyspepsia, and the Latin dis, as in dishonourable, are both derived from duo. The cognate bis gives a pejorative sense to such modern French words as bevu, or blunder, literally to sight. Traces of that second which leads you astray can be found in words such as dubious, doubt, and zweifel, for to doubt is to be double-minded. John Bunyan has his Mr. Facing Both Ways, and modern American slang, it's two-timers. Obscurely and unconsciously wise, our language confirms the findings of the mystics and proclaims the essential badness of division, a word, incidentally, in which our old enemy, too, makes another decisive appearance. Here, it may be remarked that the cult of unity on the political level is only an idolatrous substitute for the genuine way of unity on the personal and spiritual levels. Totalitarian regimes justify their existence with a philosophy of political monism, according to which the state is the ultimate power on earth. Unification under the heel of the totalitarian state is salvation, and all means to such unification, however intrinsically wicked, are right and may be used without scruple. This political monism leads in practice to excessive privilege and power for the few and oppression for the many, to discontent at home and war abroad. But excessive privilege and power are standing temptations to pride, greed, vanity and cruelty. Oppression results in fear and envy. War breeds hatred misery and despair. All such negative emotions are fatal to the spiritual life. Only the pure in heart and poor in spirit can come to the unitive knowledge of the force. Hence, the attempt to impose more unity upon societies than their individual members are ready for makes it psychologically almost impossible for those individuals to realise their unity with the force and with one another. Among the Christian Jedi and the Sufi Jedi, to whose writings we now return, the concern is primarily with the human mind and its divine essence. Quote, My me is the force, nor do I recognise any other me except the force. St. Catherine of Genoa When the psyche is unlike the force, it is also unlike itself. St. Bernard de Clairvaux I heard the voice of the Force, until it cried from me, in me, O thou I, by Azid of Bistoon. End quote. Two of the recorded anecdotes about this Sufi Jedi deserve to be quoted here. When Bayezid was asked how old he was, he replied, Four years. They said, How can that be? He answered, I have been veiled from the force by the world for 70 years, but I have seen it during the last four years. The period during which one is veiled does not belong to one's life. On another occasion, someone knocked at the Jedi's door and cried, Is Bayezid here? Bayezid answered, Is anything here except the force? Quote, Measure the mind. We must measure it with the force, or the force and the mind are one and the same. Eckhart The individual spirit is the force in its natural state, and the force, the spirit. Royce Brooke The mind, in the oneness of the force, never reaches her base, for it is of the very essence of the mind that she is powerless to plumb the depths of her creator, the force. And here one cannot speak of the mind any more, for then she has lost her nature in the oneness of divine essence, which is the force. There she is no longer called mind, but is called immeasurable being. Eckhart The knower and the known are one, 
Simple people imagine that they should see the force as if it is there and they are here. This is not so. The force and I, we are one in knowledge. Eka. End quote. I live, not I, but the force in me. Or perhaps it might be more accurate to use the verb transitively and say, I live, not I, for it is the force that lives me. Lives me as an actor lives their part. In such a case, of course, the actor is always infinitely superior to the role. Where real life is concerned, there are no Shakespearean characters. There are only Addisonian Catos, or more often, grotesque Monsieur Perichon and Charlie's aunts, mistaking themselves for Julius Caesar or the Prince of Denmark. But by a merciful dispensation, it is always in the power of every dramatis persona to get their low, stupid lines pronounced and supernaturally transfigured by the divine equivalent of the most skilled actor. Quote, How does it happen in this poor old world that the force is so great and yet nobody finds it, that the force calls so loudly and nobody hears it, that the force is so near and nobody feels it, that the force gives itself to everybody and yet nobody knows its name? People flee from the force and say they cannot find it. They turn their backs and say they cannot see it. They stop their ears and say they cannot hear it. Hans Denk End quote. Between the Catholic mystic Jedi of the 14th and 15th centuries and the Quaker Jedi of the 17th, there yawns a wide gap of time made hideous, so far as religion is concerned, with interdenominational wars and persecutions. But the gulf was bridged by a succession of people who Rufus Jones, in the only accessible English work devoted to their lives and teachings, has called the spiritual reformers. Denk, Frank, Castellio, Vigel, Everard and the Cambridge Platonists. In spite of the murdering and the madness, the apostolic Jedi succession remains unbroken. The truths that had been spoken in the Theologia Germanica, that book which Luther professed to love so much, and from which, if we may judge from his career, he learned so singularly little, were being uttered once again by Englishmen during the Civil War and under the Cromwellian dictatorship. The mystical Jedi tradition, perpetuated by the Protestant spiritual reformers, had become diffused in the religious atmosphere of the time, when George Fox had his first great opening and knew by direct experience that, quote, Every person is enlightened by the divine light of the Force, and I saw it shine through all. And they that believed in it came out of condemnation and came to the light of the Force and became the children of it. And they that hated it and did not believe in it condemned in themselves, though they made a profession of righteousness. This I saw in the pure light of the Force, without the help of any person. Neither did I then know where to find it in the Scriptures, though afterwards, searching the Scriptures, I found it. From William Fox's journal. End quote. The doctrine of the inner light of the Force achieved a clearer formulation in the writings of the second generation of Quaker Jedi. There is, wrote William Penn, something nearer to us than scriptures. It is the force in our hearts from which all scriptures come. And a little later, Robert Barclay sought to explain the direct experience of Tatvamasi in terms of an Augustinian theology that had, of course, to be considerably stretched and trimmed before it could fit the facts. Humanity, he declared in his famous theses, are fallen beings, incapable of good unless united to the divine light of the Force. This divine light of the Force within the human mind is as universal as the seed of sin. All people, heathen as well as Christian, are endowed with the inward light of the Force, even though they may know nothing of it. Liberation is for those who do not resist the inner light of the Force, and so permit a new birth of holiness within them. Quote, 
goodness need not enter into the mind, for it is there already, merely unperceived. Theologica Germanica When the ten thousand things are viewed in their oneness, we return to the origin and remain where we have always been. Sen Sen End quote. It is because we don't know who we are, because we are unaware that the abode of the force is within us, that we behave in the generally silly, the often insane, and the sometimes criminal ways that are so characteristically human. We are saved, we are liberated and enlightened by perceiving the previously unperceived good that is already within us, by returning to our eternal essence in the inner light of the force and remaining where, without knowing it, we have always been. Plato speaks in the same sense when he says in The Republic that the virtue of wisdom more than anything else contains a divine element which always remains. And in the Theotetus, he makes the point so frequently insisted upon by those who have practised the way of the Jedi that it is only by becoming one with the Force that we can know the Force. And to be Jedi is to identify ourselves with the divine element which constitutes our essential nature but of which, in our mainly voluntary ignorance, we choose to remain unaware. Quote, they are on the way to truth, those who apprehend the force as divine, light by the light. Philo. End quote. Philo was the exponent of a Hellenistic mystery religion, which grew up among the Jews of the dispersion between about 200 BCE and 100 CE. Reinterpreting the Pentateuch in terms of a metaphysical system derived from Platonism, Neo-Pythagoreanism and Stoicism, Philo transformed the whole transcendental and almost anthropomorphically personal God of the Old Testament into the imminent transcendent universal mind of the perennial philosophy of the Jedi. But even from the orthodox scribes and Pharisees of that momentous century, which witnessed, along with the dissemination of Philo's doctrines, the first beginnings of Christianity and the destruction of the temple at Jerusalem, even from the guardians of religious law, we hear significantly mystical utterances. Hillel, the great rabbi, whose teachings on humility and trust in the force and humanity read like an earlier, cruder version of some of the gospel sermons, is reported to have spoken these words to an assemblage in the courts of the temple. If I am here, it is the force speaking through the mouth of its prophet. Everyone is here. If I am not here, no one is here. Quote, the force is in all. The lover merely veils it. The force is all that lives. The lover a dead thing. Shaliludin Rumi there is a spirit in the individual, untouched by time and flesh, flowing from the force, remaining in the force, itself wholly of the spirit. In this vision, the force is ever verdant, ever flowering in all the joy and glory of its actual being. Sometimes I have called this vision the tabernacle of the soul, sometimes a spiritual light, sometimes I say it is a spark, but now I say that it is more exalted over these, and that the spirit realms are exalted above the manifest earth. So now I name it in a nobler fashion. It is free of all names and void of all forms. The force is one and simple, and yet no person in any wisdom can understand it. Eckhart End quote. Other aspects of the perennial philosophy of the Jedi are to be found in the thought systems of the ancient indigenous peoples of the world. Among the Maoris, for example, every human being is regarded as a compound of four elements, a divine, eternal principle known as the Toyora, an ego which disappears at death, a ghost shadow or mind which survives death, and finally, a body. Among the Oglala Native Americans, the divine element is called the Sikan, 
and this is regarded as identical with ton, the divine essence of the world. Other elements of the self are the nagi, the personality, and nia, the vital soul. After death, the sikan is reunited with the tun, which animates all things. The nagi survives in the ghost world of psychic phenomena, and the nia disappears into the material universe. Regarding no 20th century so-called primitive society, can we rule out the possibility of influence by or borrowing from some other culture? Consequently, we have no right to argue from the present to the past. Because many contemporary people have an esoteric philosophy that is monotheistic, with a monotheism that is sometimes of the that-art-thou variety, we are not entitled to infer offhand that Neolithic or Paleolithic peoples held similar views. More legitimate and more intrinsically plausible are the inferences that may be drawn from what we know about our own physiology and psychology. We know that human minds have proved themselves capable of everything from imbecility to quantum theory, from mind camp and sadism to the sanctity of Philip Neri, from metaphysics to crossword puzzles, power politics and the music of Beethoven. We also know that human minds are in some way associated with human brains, and we have fairly good reasons for supposing that there have been no considerable changes in the size and conformation of human brains for a good many thousands of years. Consequently, it seems justifiable to infer that human minds in the remote past were capable of as many and as various kinds and degrees of activity as our minds at the present time. It is, however, certain that many activities currently undertaken by some minds were not in the remote past undertaken by any minds at all. For this assertion, there are several obvious reasons. Certain thoughts are practically unthinkable, except in terms of an appropriate language and within the framework of an appropriate system of classification. Where these prerequisites do not exist, the thoughts in question are not expressed and not even conceived. Nor is this all. The incentives to develop certain kinds of thinking are not always present. For long periods of history and prehistory, it would seem that men and women, though perfectly capable of doing so, did not wish to pay attention to problems which their descendants now find absorbingly interesting. For example, there is no reason to suppose that between the 13th century and the 20th, the human mind underwent any kind of evolutionary change comparable to the change in the physical structure of the horse's foot during an incomparably longer span of geological time. What happened was that people turned their attention from certain aspects of reality to certain others. The result, among other things, was the development of the natural sciences. Our perceptions and our understanding are directed in large measure by our will. We are aware of and think about the things which, for one reason or another, we want to see and understand. Where there's a will, there is always an intellectual way. The capacities of the human mind are almost indefinitely great. Whatever we will to do, whether it be to come to the unitive knowledge of the force, or to manufacture self-propelled flamethrowers. That we are able to do, provided always that the necessary willingness be sufficiently intense and sustained. Many of the things to which modern people have chosen to pay attention were ignored by their predecessors. Consequently, the very means for thinking clearly and fruitfully about those subjects remained uninvented not merely during prehistoric times, but even to the opening of the modern era. The lack of a suitable vocabulary and an adequate frame of reference, and the absence of any strong and sustained desire to invent these necessary instruments of thought, here are two sufficient reasons why so many of the almost endless potentialities of the human mind remained for so long unactualised. 
Another equally cogent reason is this. Much of the world's most original and fruitful thinking is done by people of poor physique and of a thoroughly unpractical turn of mind. Because this is so, and because the value of pure thought, whether analytical or integral, has everywhere been more or less clearly recognised, provision was, and still is made by every civilised society, for giving thinkers a measure of protection from the ordinary strains and stresses of social life. The hermitage, the monastery, the college, the academy and the research laboratory, the begging bowl, the endowment, patronage and the grant of taxpayers' money. Such are the principal devices that have been used by societies to conserve that rare bird, the religious, philosophical, artistic or scientific contemplative. In many so-called primitive societies, conditions are hard and there is no surplus wealth. The born contemplative has to face the struggle for existence and social inclusion without protection. The result, in most cases, is that they either die young or are too desperately busy merely keeping alive to devote their attention to anything else. When this happens, the prevailing philosophy will be that of the hardy, extroverted person of action. All this shed some light, dim it is true and merely inferential, on the problem of the perennialness of the perennial philosophy of the Jedi. In India, the scriptures were regarded not as revelations made at some given moment in history, but as eternal gospels, existent from everlasting to everlasting, as contemporary with humanity, or for that matter with any other kind of corporeal or incorporeal being, possessed of reason. A similar point of view is expressed by Aristotle, who regards the fundamental truths of religion as everlasting and indestructible. There have been ascents and falls, periods, literally roads around, or cycles of progress and regress, but the great fact of the force as the first mover of a universe which partakes of its divinity has always been recognised. In light of what we know about prehistoric humanity, amounting to nothing more than a few chipped stones, some paintings, drawings and sculptures, and of what we may legitimately infer from other, better documented fields of knowledge, what are we to think of these traditional doctrines? We know that born contemplatives in the realms both of analytic and of integral thought have turned up in fair numbers and at frequent intervals during recorded history. There is therefore every reason to suppose that they turned up before history was recorded, that many of these people died young or were unable to exercise their talents is certain. But a few of them must have survived. In this context, it is highly significant that among many contemporary indigenous peoples, two thought patterns are found. An exoteric pattern for the unphilosophic many, and an esoteric pattern for the initiated few, often monotheistic, with a belief in a force, not merely of power, but of goodness and wisdom. There is no reason to suppose that circumstances were any harder for prehistoric people than they are for many unfortunate contemporary people. But if an esoteric monotheism of the kind that seems to come naturally to the born thinker is possible in contemporary societies, the majority of whose members accept the sort of polytheistic philosophy that seems to come naturally to people of action, a similar esoteric doctrine might have existed in prehistoric times. True, the modern esoteric doctrines may have been derived from more developed cultures, but the significant fact remains that if so derived, they yet had a meaning for certain members of the prehistoric society and were considered valuable enough to be carefully preserved. We have seen that many thoughts are unthinkable apart from an appropriate vocabulary and frame of reference, but the fundamental ideas of the perennial philosophy of the Jedi can be formulated in very simple vocabulary, and the experiences to which the ideas can refer and indeed must, be had immediately and apart from any vocabulary whatsoever. 
Strange openings and theophanies are granted to quite small children, who are often profoundly and permanently affected by these experiences. We have no reason to suppose that what happens now to persons with small vocabularies did not happen in remote antiquity. In the modern world, as Vaughan and Traherne and Wordsworth amongst others have told us, the child tends to grow out of their direct awareness of the force. For the habit of analytical thought is fatal to the intuitions of integral thinking, whether on the psychic or the spiritual level. Psychic preoccupations may be, and often are, a major obstacle in the way of genuine spiritual unity. In indigenous societies now, and presumably in the remote past, there is much preoccupation with, and a widespread talent for, psychic thinking. But a few people may have worked their way through psychic into genuinely spiritual experience, just as in modern industrialised societies, a few people work their way out of the prevailing preoccupation with matter and through the prevailing habits of analytical thought into direct experience of the force. Such, then, very briefly, are the reasons for supposing that the historical traditions of classical antiquity may be true. It is interesting to find that at least one distinguished contemporary ethnologist is in agreement with Aristotle and the Vedantists. Orthodox ethnology, writes Dr Paul Radin in his Primitive Man as Philosopher, has been nothing but an enthusiastic and quite uncritical attempt to apply the Darwinian theory of evolution to the facts of social experience. And, he adds, no progress in ethnology will be achieved until scholars rid themselves once and for all of the curious notion that everything possesses a history, until they realise that certain ideas and certain concepts are as ultimate for the human psyche as specific physiological reactions are ultimate for them as biological beings. In Dr. Radin's view, among these ultimate concepts is monotheism. Such monotheism is often no more than the recognition of a single, obscured but numinous power ruling the world. But it may sometimes be genuinely ethical and spiritual. The 19th century's mania for history and prophetic utopianism tended to blind the eyes of even its acutest thinkers, to the timeless facts of eternity. Thus we find T. H. Green writing of mystical union as though it were an evolutionary process and not, as all the evidence seems to show, a state which human beings have always had it in their power to realise. An animal organism, which has its history in time, gradually becomes the vehicle of an eternally complete consciousness, which in itself can have no history but a history of the process by which the animal organism becomes its vehicle. But, in actual fact, it is only in regard to peripheral knowledge that there has been a genuine historical development. Without much lapse of time and much accumulation of skills and information, there can be but an imperfect knowledge of the material world. But direct awareness of the eternally complete consciousness which is the ground of the material world, is a possibility occasionally actualised by some human beings at almost any stage of their own personal development, from childhood to old age, and at any period of the species' history. <laughs>